Good afternoon. Thank you for attending this uh, GeoISC International webinar. We have uh, some people still connecting, so we'll start in two to three minutes. Thank you for your understanding. Hello, I'm back. Thank you all for attending this webinar. After the two minutes regular delays for a webinar, thank you all for attending uh, this um, new international webinar on uh, geo risk. So you can see today we have a busy agenda to promote the de-risking of geothermal project. I will start shortly presenting you what is about this Joyce project. Maybe you are familiar with it. We started in October 2018, so nearly uh, 32 months ago, and we are about to close um, our activities in, in uh, September 2021. And you will see today the main results because uh, we have already uh, published our main results and we are here really to present you today and to see with you how we can use them. Um, we have two sessions this afternoon. The first is on looking geothermal investment with the Georist tools we have created. For that, you have the main uh, authors of the different tools. First, we will have Thomas Leguenon from the French Geocal Survey, BRGM, how to use the Georist register and the online tool. You see it's a first of a kind uh, risk register with risk ranking. After that, we have the pleasure to have Attila Kushbus from uh, Hungary. He will present us 10 years simulation of a risk insurance tool, but we expect also from him to say some words about the fantastic news we had from Hungary for two weeks from now, that they have just launched a de-risking scheme in Hungary. And to conclude this first session, we will have uh, Ferid uh, Seidov from the Gecko, a German company, um, to explain us what are the framework conditions for establishing such a scheme. And today, we have a pleasure to have uh, Alexander Richter, from the Iceland Renewable Energy Cluster, former president of IGA, expert in uh, risk insurance and, and from the banking sector in his previous life. And we have a pleasure to have him today to give us a feedback about the tools we, we are uh, presenting today. The second session of our discussion today is about the successful risk mitigation schemes. And we will have a global overview of existing schemes. Indeed, the risking project is not thing new for some countries, and we have to see what are the lessons learned to replicate them. So first, we have a pleasure to have Christian Boissavi from the French Geothermal Association, and he will present the new French fund. So what are the news from this new scheme? We have a pleasure to have also Ilker Kozak from the Turkish bank, TKB, uh, to explain us what are the first lessons learned from the Turkish fund. You know that the first call was uh, two years ago, and now they are about to learn the second call. And here we we'll have two panelists to explain us what happened in the rest of the world. First, Carlos Yorker from Think Joe Energy, and um, to explain us uh, what are the experience in Chile. And last but not least, we'll have Alison Thompson from the Canadian Geothermal Association to see what uh, what happens in, in Canada and. Uh, what is the, the needs for the industry. 
And here also, we are asking the feedback of, of an expert from finance and insurance. So we have the pleasure to have today Matthias Tonis from Munich Re. Uh, of course, from all of us, we will have for the first and the second session some roundtable discussion and Q&A. Uh, you can use uh, also with this GoToWebinar tool uh, some questions. Um, you can use the chat. You can raise questions in the question session. And uh, we are not sure we'll be able, but you can try also to raise your hand. And if we are able, we'll ask you to put an oral question. With this short uh, introduction, I'm now starting to present you the Jurispray briefly because you see that from the agenda today, we have all the experts presenting you the tools. But just to remind you, um, what is the frame of Jurisc? Sometimes, but my slides are coming. Try to put them in full screen mode so it should be easier for you to see them. Okay, it's coming nearly there. So, Jurisc, as, as mentioned, uh, started uh, in, in 2018 and it's about to be concluded in September. It's a project supported by the European Union Funding Programme, Horizon 2020. And uh, in our project, you can see from, from the consortium, we tried really to, to develop this project to have a, a consensus and, and, and the vision of three kind of actors. So um, in, in such a project, you need to have, oh, sorry, you need to have the endorsement of first of the, the project developers because it, it's them taking the risk in a project. And from that, we have different uh, um, stakeholders, market actors, members of EJEC, members of a French association, members of a Turkish association. Um, in top of that, we have one also Greek company, PPC Renewable, which is now developing a project and is about to drill. Uh, we had also the members of a German association, a Swiss association. So you can see many market actors were involved in this project. We had also, um, we wanted to have the de-risking uh, understanding with science-based, and it's why, we have, it's why we had also members of Geocal Survey, like the Hungarian Geocal Survey, the French Geocal Survey, the Polish um, Academy of Science, um, and et cetera, et cetera. We had also some service companies like Gecko, we had energy agencies, entities from the public sector like Tubitac or, or Cress. And last but not least, we had also, as mentioned, the Turkish bank and the Swiss um, Department of Energy to provide also some uh, input on, on financing and, and the banking sector. So with all these actors, we hope we have been able to really give you a transparent and open view and the risking project. Uh, what has been the, 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 the methodology for, 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 for this Jewish project? Um, me, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in, uh, in risk insurance and trying to establish a European risk insurance for, for nearly, nearly 20 years, I could say. And for 10 years with the Geolic proposal, we have something already. So we know that we have some successful scheme already existing in France from the 80s, in, in Netherlands from, from the 90s, and some tries in Germany, um, also applied in, in Switzerland and in Turkey. So we know that some are existing. So the objective was to really have a country with some experience, France, Germany, Switzerland, Turkey and the three key countries where within the 36 months of project we want to implement such a scheme, Poland, Hungary, and Greece. And as you could heard also from my introduction, in Hungary, we have been already successful, and we hope that in Poland and Greece, we'll have soon a de-risking instrument. So the first set of countries with the key countries were the one you can find in red. But our objective is really to replicate, duplicate, and promote all these schemes. So we have some, selected some key countries in Europe to also uh, liaise with and to see how we can have some de-risking instruments, Denmark, Netherlands, Croatia, Belgium, Slovenia, and Serbia, and some key countries uh, outside Europe 
Mexico, Kenya, Chile, and Canada. And you can see today we have some representatives from both Chile and Canada, and we would like to see with them how the tools we have developed could be useful also for them. Um, we have started, uh, strangely you could say, but uh, we maybe thought it was good to start with a blank page. Okay, we know how works risk insurance, but are we sure that the risk insurance today is answering the challenge of the market, is answering the challenge of the project developers, is answering all the challenges you have in developing your project and operating your project or decommissioning your plan. So we have started with this work of risk assessment and risk ranking. I don't go to the details because we have uh, in the first session in-depth presentation of what has been this work of identifying the risk, uh, ranking the risk, but also report this risk with an online tool. The second part of our project um, was to look at the tools for the risking project. So we have a, a full overview and a comparison of the different risk mitigation schemes with a report published online. We had also an extensive work from uh, the Swiss Federal Office of Energy on the framework conditions for establishing such a scheme. So you need indeed some regulations allowing the establishment of a de-risking scheme in your country. And in this report, you can find what are these key parameters. Um, on that, you have a presentation later, but also how um, a risk insurance has to adapt according to market maturity. Um, it's a concept which was the basis of our project. Also, yeah, don't go to the details because I'm not sure Fred will go to the details, but market maturity is key for designing the right tool for the right market. And you can see, I'm sure, that during the discussion, it will be highlighted several times. You see that we have a jurist tool for the developers, but we have also developed a help desk for public authorities, so people in charge of establishing and managing such a scheme. We try to provide them the tools they need for establishing such a scheme. The help desk is available online, and uh, you can see a screenshot from the website. All information is available for free online. As I mentioned, we had some key countries, Hungary, Poland, Greece, and A, we tried from the start of a project to create a relationship with the decision makers and to have a series of engagement, notably roundtable workshop at national level to uh, see how we can uh, establish a scheme. In the establishment of a scheme, we wanted also to have a mid-term perspective, a 10 years operation simulation, and Attila Kushbus uh, also will present you what is this tool, how, how we can be sure that it's not a one-shot de-risking scheme, but you have a, a, a mid-term view, a 10 years view on how you can develop your project with some security for investment. Today, we are in an international webinar, so it's not only focusing on Europe, and it's why um, this work package on replication and promotion globally is important. We look at uh, what could be done in some countries in Europe, in some countries in the rest of the world, and a specific attention has been put also on a cross-country um, insurance scheme. It's something we try to establish or to see the establishment at a European level, but maybe it could start with a collaboration of some countries. We know that the reservoir uh, the, geothermal the geothermal resources is cross-border, so why not also to have a de-risking approach cross-border? This is uh, the repetition of a previous slide, but you can see so the different set of countries, and, and the idea really is to have some lessons learned and to see how we can uh, exchange best practices with, with other uh, countries in Europe and all over the world. The tools are also ready on, 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 on these activities, and notably some capacity building uh, activities has been performed. And uh, in the help desk, we have updated all this information. So you have also the capacity building activities available online in the help desk chapter. And when we speak about uh, all the risking scheme, as I mentioned, we uh, 
put a lot of effort and attention to promotion of our tools. So uh, the webinar today is one of them, but we have uh, realized, uh, I don't know how many webinars, but, but nearly more, more than 15 webinars in, in the 36 months of our project. We had a lot of events. We had also a media campaign uh, published uh, several reports and all of this information you can find in, in the website joyceproject.eu. I thank you for your attention. As I say, my role as a coordinator was really to, to, to make um, the experts working together and uh, being able to deliver the tools. So I finish and I end my presentation on the overview of the GIS project. And it's my pleasure now to start the session one on unlocking geothermal investment with Juris tools and first give the floor to Thomas Leguenan for presenting us this online tool. Flo Thomas, floor is yours. Okay, good. Uh, hello everyone. I hope you can see my, uh, my screen now. So I will present you today the, um, the tools that we developed in GRS for, for risk assessment. Um, so I, I won't go into details on this slide because Philippe just explained to you what, um, what GeoRisk is about. Just want to stress uh, once again that the risk, what we mean by risk in this project is mainly the possibility of financial loss for developers of geothermal projects. It includes, of course, such risk as environmental risk, but it's not exclusively uh, about uh, risk, uh, safety risk. Um, why do a, a risk assessment? It's a uh, it's necessary step to get a good understanding of the risks before we can mitigate it, with, which is a subject of uh, georisk in this seminar. Um, Understanding the risk or performing the risk assessment means uh, to, to understand what can go wrong. Uh, and we use for this risk identification and, and we produce a risk register. And then we can ask how likely is it and what are the associated consequences, which we perform in a risk analysis. And only then we can ask what can we do about it uh, because we know how we can prioritize our actions. So in, in this uh, project, we developed uh, three tools that are closely internal related. First, we have an online risk register, which we want to be a reference tool for risk identifications. And it also provides uh, details about technical mitigation options. We have a online uh, risk survey or results from a risk survey we perform, which gives you indication of how various actors of the geothermal field rank uh, the various risks we have. And now we have a spreadsheet uh, allowing to perform the, your own risk assessment dedicated to, to your project. So uh, I first show you the, the risk register. Uh, I go quickly on this slide. It's just to, to show you that we, we did a lot of uh, literature review. We took a lot of experience from past projects. Uh, in the end, we simplified uh, the register a lot. It's mainly uh, we talk about big top events. Uh, so uh, in this kind of bow tie representation of the risk, we mainly focus on top events. And it's not too detailed about threats and consequences. Um, our idea was to have, uh, it was okay to have overlaps and not okay to have missing uh, stuff in it. Uh, I, I go quickly on this, so you can go on, on the website, uh, georisk-project.eu. You can click on the georisk tool here, and here you can get so a table, uh, which is a list of risks which uh, you can filter by some kind of categories we, we made up. Uh, we have also tried to rank all the risks by phases, etc. cetera. Um, if you, so there's about 50 risks in it, and we now, after a lot of uh, consultations, we are pretty confident it, it covers a lot of, of ground. So 
it's a very strong basis to develop a risk assessment. If you click uh, on one risk, you get additional details. So um, a description field uh, and also many options for uh, mitigation. And uh, if you have new suggestions, we can. It's easy for us to update the the, the sheets. So we focus here on technical mitigation, which is a, a first step before we can think about the financial mitigation once we are not able to mitigate technically uh, our risks. I quickly go on to our risk survey. Um, so the risk survey was interested in answering the quest second question. How likely is it? What are the associated consequences? Now, typically we do this with uh, maybe, you know, a risk matrix. Uh, which is a matrix like this, four by four, uh, a scale of four to rank the potential damage and a uh, scale of four to rank the potential likelihood of each risk. So we uh, provided questionnaires to all the jurist countries uh, and asked for each risk uh, the two questions. How likely is it? How damaging is it? Uh, I spare you the details. We did a uh, some lot of calculations so this is just a, a, the combination of all the answers we, we received for all risks so it, it's not very uh, it's not meaningful as, as such but just for you the details that we did a um, um, robust ranking of all the risks comparing to uh, how likely is it that it's higher than this average risk or lower than this average risk. So just giving you the results today, if you want more details, uh, there's a lot of details on the website um, if you want. And so just giving you the details, we have an overall ranking of all the risks that we uh, have in GeoRisk. Uh, just showing you that the, the main risk by, by far actually is this D10 risk, insufficient food in the formation. And there's a lot of uh, D risks here which are all related to uh, geological risks. And it's not so surprising, but it's interesting to see that among the first risks also we have like this one, changes in policies, laws, tax. So mainly political risk, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, political risks. And also this B2 here is quite well ranked, the lack of financing. So it's interesting to see how a mix of geology and socio-economic uh, risks uh, arise in our ranking. We can have we have uh, rankings for various categories. So all the geologist countries first we can separate electricity and heat. So here is the result for electricity, the first risks actually, and we can see that we have new risks uh, coming up. So like well casing collapse, uh, mostly. Uh, so that's a risk most relevant to very deep uh, uh, drilling, um, which is typical of electricity, of course. And also low social acceptance is more preeminent here. Also maybe more associated with uh, deaths and maybe induced seismicity. Now I want to spend a little more time than the previous presentation on the risk assessment spreadsheet we made, which is really where uh, users can develop their own risk assessment. We had a first version in 2019, now we have a second version uh, that you can download on, on this link. You can also find the link on the GeoRisk website, of course. Um, it starts by acknowledging that not all risks may be interesting to all projects. So you can pre-select, pre-screen the, the risks that you want to see in the uh, assessment just by putting zero and one in this and, and you won't hear about these risks again. Uh, we also have the possibility to really tailor the rating tables to your need or your uh, use, uh, what your company does, etc. So this is just an example that we can have any scale you want on likelihood and damage from two to 10 uh, scale to them uh, increment. So this is just a random 
example where I did a five by eight scale. And you can also, uh, we have three levels of acceptability and you can really put uh, any color you want on any, any uh, element. So that's uh, really tailored to, to your need. So uh, I won't detail again the, the math, it's just to show you the possibility. So then we have a very, let's straightforward risk assessment spreadsheet where we have each risk uh, that we pre-screened and you can rank according to your scale uh, each risk and we have little icons here showing you which one is too high, too low. Uh, there's a first assessment and then we can do a reassessment generally maybe once we have mitigation measures in place. Uh, so, by the way, this is purely random numbers I put, so you, you would expect a risk to go down usually if, you, if you're doing your job well. Uh, and, uh, of course, in the spreadsheet, once you've uh, ranked and assessed your risk, we have a lot of uh, various graphs uh, to help you understand where you can have more uh, uh, efficiency in reducing the risk. So uh, we have bar charts when you can have the various uh, risks. Uh, and we have also some matrices, uh, either with bubble or with uh, text directly. You can see in the text version of the matrix that we have the same color scheme that we designed in the previous uh, uh, sheets. Uh, and and it, you can quickly see which risks are acceptable or less acceptable, so which risks you, you need to focus if you want to mitigate uh, your project, your project's risk. Um, and also in development, we have a quantitative risk assessment tool that is uh, accessible on the same uh, link I showed previously. So it's very raw for the moment, not too many explanations. Uh, the idea is that uh, to make a proper quantitative risk assessment, we cannot use a risk matrix. Uh, we instead have to get a, a actual distribution of outcomes of what's, uh, what will happen. And we have some kind of simple uh, table to just uh, assign weights to various outcomes. And it's quite easy to make uh, just a distribution of probability. And now we are also uh, working on a, a way to simply like add two distributions or subtract two distributions and, and to show how so uh, a distribution may be compared to one objective or something. So this is still in development, but I, I'm happy to show it today. Uh, and so just to conclude, our JRISC tool is so three parts, a risk register, a risk survey, and a risk assessment spreadsheet. And we think it's a robust uh, basis for improving risk assessment practices in the geothermal projects which is the first step to, uh, of course, a, then a better mitigation of risks, the condition for success that we want. And with that, uh, I thank you, and I, I would be happy to answer any question you may have later. Thank you very much, Thomas. Indeed, it was not easy to present this complex tool, but you have successfully done it, and I'm sure there will be some questions to better understand it for some people. No, I'm giving the floor. <laughs> to Attila Kashbes from Geothermal Express, a service company in Hungary, to present us the fund modeling calculation with a 10 year simulation. Attila, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Do you see my screen? Yes, not yet in full screen mode, but yes, we see the screen. If not, be back to, to your screen and, and it was. Yes, this is. Yes. It's okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, so <clears throat> uh, my name is Attila Koibush, and our uh, task was 
to, uh, to calculate some uh, calculations, some modeling, and a 10 year simulation that relates to the operations and the financials in the three target countries, Hungary, Greece, and Poland. And uh, when we uh, started the calculations, naturally we uh, determine the objective of this simulation. So we want to calculate the, the 10 years cash flow of the risk mitigation scheme that is under planning with estimating realistic projects, scheme operations, and costs. And, and we have to prove, we wanted to prove that these schemes can be sustainable. Uh, concerning the process, we determined firstly the legal forms of the risk mitigation projects, the aimed technical uh, issues, the ris risks, and the operating forms of the risk mitigation system management, of course. And uh, also, we had to estimate the assumptions of the key influencing parameters. They are the premium, the, the risk over, and the success rate, and also the costs of the system management. Uh, we had to make decisions concerning the, the risk mitigation uh, project types, the geological structures, available contract types and hypothetical possibilities as well. And here is uh, the, 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 the uh, list uh, what kind of pro uh, decisions we uh, had to make. Uh, in the first columns, uh, there is the, uh, the decision points, uh, project types, geological structures, and so on. And uh, uh, in the second column, the opportunities. And in the third column, uh, our Hungarian decision, on our uh, recommendation uh, concerning the Hungarian risk mitigation scheme. We organize altogether three uh, uh, national workshops. And in the workshops, we uh, prepared a questionnaire for the, for the key stakeholders and collected their, uh, their answers and uh, analyzed it. And uh, our Hungarian decisions are based on the, uh, decision, uh, on the opinion of the key stakeholders. In this case, uh, concerning the project types, we selected all deep uh, short-term projects. It, it means that it relates to the, to the exploration phase of a deep geothermal project. Concerning the, the geo, uh, geological structures, <clears throat> we selected both sandstones and fractured carbonate reservoirs, uh, that is uh, regular in, in the uh, Pannonian Basin. Uh, related to the, to the contract types, uh, we selected a grant, and it is subsidized uh, premium in advance, and uh, the, uh, with, with the post-financed fee. Uh, the hypothetical possibilities can be successful, fail, and generally it can be uh, uh, half success, partly successful, but, <clears throat> but we recommended mainly the, the successful and fail in the, in the uh, calculations. The stream uh, scheme structure, uh, we selected the, the French structure. Uh, we analyze all existing European uh, risk mitigation schemes, and we, we uh, uh, our uh, uh, selection was the French. Uh, that is uh, similar as uh, the Hungarian will be established. And uh, concerning the sustainability. Uh, we recommended the scheme mixed uh, with the support system. In this case, naturally, itself, uh, the, this operation is not sustainable, but there is uh, support included, some project support included. Here you can see the, the proposed operating chart of uh, the recommended uh, uh, scheme in Hungary. The Ministry of Innovation and Technology establishes uh, the risk management fund. Uh, some kind of secretariat uh, uh, operates this fund. The technical committee makes the strategic decisions and 
the expert pool, the expert team uh, analyzes the, the, the projects and uh, analyzes the, the success of the, of the exploration. The public or private developers uh, uh, pay the fees into the risk management fund and gets the reimbursement in case of failure uh, from, the, from the secretariat, from the uh, risk uh, management fund. Then we uh, calculate, uh, then we collected uh, 30 uh, estimated projects in Hungary. Uh, in Hungary, the, the geothermal uh, sector is, is uh, fairly traditional. In Budapest, it is almost 100 years old. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the uh, geological exploration has a lot of data and we uh, know the main underground uh, uh, thermal water bodies. Uh, we selected from all, almost all the, the uh, thermal water bodies uh, one or two uh, projects and we determined that it is porous or karstic fractured or crystalline basement uh, uh, geology with this geology. The uh, uh, project the, uh, duration is regularly two years because the, it, it is the uh, duration of the exploration, the deep geothermal project exploration. We have uh, almost everywhere all uh, GNG studies and uh, project concept data, and we determine the project capacity. In this case, we, we determined the, the exploration costs, uh, and uh, we uh, uh, determined the success rate as 90 project. It means that from 30 projects, three is unsuccessful. You can see three failure uh, where we have to pay risk over. And uh, 27 is a successful project. In this case, the success rate is, is uh, 90%. And we uh, set up this, this table. In the 10 years, every year, there are three newly contracted projects. And uh, ge generally two of them or three of them is uh, finishing every year. So the, the number of pending projects uh, excesses from uh, three until seven in, in, in every year. The closed projects are two or three. And in this case, we can calculate the uh, calculate uh, 10 million euro is launching amount uh, uh, with by the fund and we can calculate with uh, the premium of every year the the premium of the uh, three newly income uh, projects we can calculate the expenses of the of the uh, scheme of the operation of this whole scheme and the payment for unsuccessful projects with 75% risk cover. You can see the three, uh, three estimated unsuccessful project payments. And in this case, we can uh, set up the, the total asset balance. And we can show that uh, in this case, the, uh, the system can be uh, sustainable financially. However, it means that the premium is 10%, it, it's uh, rather high. The risk over is uh, 75%, it's, it's fairly good. And the success rate is 90%. We believe it, we can uh, achieve this, this rate. So it was the first uh, uh, simulation. And then the, the uh, Greek partners uh, prepared a similar si simulation. However, in Greece, uh, the, the uh, geological environment is uh, different. In the continental phase, the risk is lower, but in, in, the, uh, in the islands, the risk is, is uh, rather high. Therefore, they calculated with a different success rate. And in this case, uh, uh, you can see that uh, if, uh, if 
uh, uh, they calculate with 90% risk, the, the system is also uh, sustainable, but they calculated with less uh, 75, uh, 66 and 50% uh, success rate. And in this case, unfortunately, the scheme needs uh, support because uh, the, the fund is uh, decreasing every year. And uh, in the, with this uh, simulation, with this model, they can calculate how much support this scheme is needed if the success rate is only uh, 50%. So it is, uh, the system is uh, appropriate, not only uh, 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 sustainable uh, operation, but also some uh, calculation if the system is not sustained, uh, sustainable because of the uh, geological environment. The Polish partners uh, calculated with uh, 10% premium, 8, 6, and 4% premium. And also they calculated with different risk over 75 and 70% risk over. And you can see if the, the uh, premium is lower, uh, the, the system is lower, less, less uh, sustainable. So uh, we made a lot of, uh, uh, analysis uh, which are the, the most important uh, parameters and we have to say that the, uh, the success rate is the, the uh, most uh, sensitive because 90% uh, uh, is uh, necessary for a, for a sustainable operation. So concerning the, the summary of this all uh, analysis, uh, as calculations and analysis, we demonstrated it in, in three countries and uh, uh, Christian Boas, we calculated it uh, for the operating French system as well. And we determined that the simulation uh, method is uh, appropriate for, for, uh, uh, for all kind of analysis and planning a new uh, system from a uh, financial point of view. There were a lot of similarities in the countries, but naturally there were differences, differences and, and the Greek partners demonstrate, demonstrated that even in one country, if uh, the, the risk uh, level is different, in this case, the success rate level is different. We can uh, make calculations with this uh, method as well. And uh, some words about the, the new Hungarian risk mitigation scheme. It has been launched this month. Uh, uh, well, the related the Hungarian ministry, the Ministry of Innovation and Techno Te Technology was open to follow the results of the GeoRisk project from its start from uh, 2018. And we uh, consulted with them a lot of times. They participated in the national workshops. They were active. And also they, they uh, yes, they follow the, uh, our results. And uh, so the communication was continuous. And uh, the ministry decided to establish the first Hungarian geothermal risk mitigation fund. Well, a key challenge was uh, to find the financial resources. Uh, lastly, the, uh, the uh, ministry devoted 16.7 uh, million uh, euro for, for this fund. And the first call for the project was issued uh, this year, this month. And uh, the call is uh, to support the drilling production and uh, the reinjection doublets. So uh, the, the exploration phase and uh, the, the uh, uh, well, uh, the, the field development phase. And the contracts uh, with the projects uh, follow a mixed system. Uh, it, can, it includes uh, project support and also a risk insurance. So it is a risky insurance, but uh, project support as well. 
and uh, the first contracts are to be signed this year and uh, perhaps perhaps uh, even uh, uh, shorter time and the program operator is the mining and geological survey of hungary they are the partners uh, in uh, geo risk projects so they 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 know all the res results of this uh, geo risk project so we think it is also a very good uh, result of of uh, the projects we have uh, we have some recommendations. We, we think that a uh, risk mitigation scheme is a very effective way to support the geothermal sector, and after a transition time, it can be privatized. Therefore, it has to be an important tool for supporting the geothermal sector in long term. Uh, during the planning a new risk mitigation scheme, scheme, it is important to take into consideration uh, the long experience of the former and existing schemes. And when we establish a new scheme, uh, 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 to, to establish a, a, a very new uh, scheme in, in a new country, it is uh, not surely the most practical way they can join to the operating systems as well. For example, in the Pannonian Basin, the, the geological risks are all, 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 almost the same. Uh, in this case, perhaps in the Pannonian Basin, we can organize a regional scheme as well. And in order to push the overhead cost uh, and the premium to the lowest level, that is very important in the sustainability, uh, establishing a, a larger international risk mitigation, seems, uh, risk mitigation scheme seems to be more and more feasible. And uh, we think the European geothermal risk mitigation system should be considered. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Attila. Indeed, it was a really good presentation. And thank you for reporting indeed this news about the Hungarian scheme. I'm sure that many other participants will look at that into detail to propose some projects. And now to conclude this third presentation on unworking risk, I give the floor to Ferid Zaydov from Gecko Company to show us and explain us what are the framework conditions that there be on market maturity. So, floor is yours. Greetings, everyone. Uh, a short feedback uh, over your, uh, whether you see my presentation or not would be helpful. Philip? I confirm. Yeah. So with this, I will start. So. First, I'll uh, just uh, run through the commercial readiness index, which will be a main uh, evaluation system for the market maturity. As uh, most of you must know, in Europe, we're very uh, used to be using the technological readiness index or level. This is a table on the left side used uh, mainly for development of new technologies. On the right side, uh, there is a commercial readiness index which is evaluating the readiness of the given technology after it's reaching the level nine um, and its uh, performance in the commercial uh, market and uh, from the beginning stages up until the uh, completely uh, integration in the overall market and becoming a bankable asset class as you may see here the first two uh, levels of commercial readiness index are uh, synonymous to the uh, ninth order to the technological readiness index. Based on this, uh, we have developed an adjustment for the geothermal market. So here, the first two levels are basically a, a trial and error and a, a trial uh, pilot plans uh, in the given region in order to uh, secure the success of uh, utilizing the geothermal energy. On the level three, there's a commercial uh, commercial scale up when uh, there is enough evidence that the geothermal energy can be tapped. Uh, the region starts to develop the, this technology 
in the yeah in the given uh, reserve. At the level four, there is uh, there is already multiple commercial applications for the technology for the geothermal. So there, there could be uh, in our case electricity and uh, perhaps the district heating or depending on the region, of course. And there is already a competition uh, starting in this uh, level. And the last level, which is a combination of five and six, is the last level where the regulatory in, um, environment becomes completely standardized and you can actually predict air, everything um, about the project from its start until the end. So based on this, um, we have developed this kind of uh, table. Um, our objective is to move from the public support schemes at the very uh, early stage of the market to completely private schemes uh, by the end of the market maturity levels. So at the bottom of this uh, chart, you may see the commercial readiness index levels as uh, presented above. On the left side, you may see the uh, levels of risks. And uh, depending on the level of the risk that we have, a specific uh, risk mitigation scheme must be applied or should be applied in order to achieve the highest uh, success rate. So as you may see, the grants and convertible grants should be applied only in case when there is a very high risk uh, in the market. When it comes to a, a lower, a bit lower a level of risk, there is when there is some kind of uh, security already in place. Uh, we can move to the uh, loan, loan guarantee and contingency grant schemes. Um, the level three of the commercial readiness index is a scale up uh, stage. And it is one of the most important stages in the development of the commercial market. Therefore, you may see the la uh, very high amount of uh, different risk mitigation schemes applied here. Uh, the objective at this point is to uh, attract as many investors and private companies as possible into the market and to uh, generate a positive uh, outcome uh, based on all the projects that are being made. Once that is achieved, we can move to the uh, uh, private insurance scheme. So the investors are on board, but what is still needed is to ensure that the project will uh, will be will will see a successful end. So uh, the public entities agencies take on the role of the insurance uh, agencies and provide insurance for such kind of a projects. Um, parallel with that, there's a public-private partnerships. This could be a partnership in order to give loans or partially as well for the insurance. Lastly, uh, when uh, these, the, the, the market has reached its uh, lowest levels of risk, so when the uh, underground is very well known, we can move to the private uh, risk insurance schemes uh, where there is only little risk that something goes wrong. And if it is possible, uh, then uh, the consequences are very well known and the risk mitigations, technical uh, mitigations uh, techniques can be applied to prevent them. We'll shortly go through the uh, each risk mitigation scheme. So in order to understand what all of them are, uh, we, we have presented a monetary explanation. So the grants and convertible grants uh, are mainly the basic two risk mitigation schemes when there is only little uh, required to pay back, or uh, the, the, the payback could be in form of, of either money or information or something else. The repayable uh, grants are basically loans. Public insurance schemes are insurance schemes uh, sponsored by the uh, agencies, public agencies. Uh, private public partnerships are the schemes that are sponsored, uh, well, depending on the uh, given uh, given uh, scheme, it could be 50 to 50 or different ratios of investment from each party. 
And the lastly, there's an insurance schemes, uh, an example of which could be a Munich RE. Uh, so this is the mainly the, the last stage of uh, securing the risks through the uh, private uh, companies. Now, in order to evaluate uh, the, uh, the, the commercial readiness index or the market maturity, we need to go through the indicators. So there is, uh, these are all the indicators there. Um, first is the regulatory environment, which is uh, responsible for the standards in place, um, which are regulating the flow of the projects from the getting the license to start a project, uh, as well as the securing the project uh, and its lifetime and so on. The mining laws, water uh, safety laws are all part of the regulatory environment. Stakeholder acceptance are responsible for the uh, three stakeholders, which is the public opinion about the uh, geothermal energy, uh, the investors, as well as uh, the, the political uh, view of the technology. Technological performance is stating for the technological performance. And financial performance cost is uh, including all uh, issues, all subject that includes the costs and possible uh, changes in cost. Revenue is based on what kind of, uh, um, yeah. The, 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 the wins could be made uh, throughout the lifetime of the project. Industry's supply chain is responsible for all kind of technologies uh, currently available in the market. Market opportunities are uh, basically concerning themselves with the business models and company maturity, which is responsible for the experience of the local companies. Now. Uh, in order to create the framework, we had to uh, divide them into each uh, transitions from a basic uh, risk mitigation scheme to another one. So first of all, it is a transition from grants where we have the highest uh, risks to the loan schemes, uh, the commercial readiness index uh, three. And in order to achieve that, all of the a criteria must be fulfilled, or at least most of them must be fulfilled. In case of regulatory environment, there should be a clarification of responsibilities. For example, in uh, one of this uh, is an issue still in Switzerland. There is no centralized uh, um, any kind of uh, uh, legal uh, pathway for uh, agencies which are responsible for uh, running such kind of a project. There should be a steady operation permissions, clarification of pu public agency and jurisdictions and responsibilities, uh, and development of legal security systems, uh, which is very important for the uh, stakeholders and uh, investors which are trying to get in into this branch. The stakeholder acceptance must uh, be focused on providing sufficient evidence that the projects and the branch is trustworthy and uh, worthy for them to step in. As I said, these are all the stakeholders here, investors, project developers, population and politics. Technological background uh, must be focusing at this level uh, with improvement of geological data. Those several projects that have been uh, drilled and successfully completed in the region must be uh, must provide data for the further development of the project. There should be also a presence of cor corresponding technologies. So if there is some kind of uh, issues arising during the uh, first project, is these, these should be considered uh, in case you want to further uh, develop the region. And monitoring system uh, and equipment should be should start being uh, developed in order to track the the, uh, the changes in the subsurface area. The uh, financial performance cost and revenue should be uh, firstly uh, focusing with the uh, minimizing the, the the deviations from the plant cost and also improving the plans 
and uh, include some kind of extra expenses that could arise during the project. The performance revenue should be focusing on stable prices and stable contract partners, uh, contracted purchase uh, quantities and currency stability is very important. Actually, if you look at the uh, risk uh, risk register from uh, Thomas previously, the, these two lowest level of the issues are one of the most uh, higher risks that was being uh, evaluated by the operators. So they need really uh, uh, purchase quantities and the stability in the region in order to be able to uh, step into the market as the geothermal projects are taking quite long. The adjustment of the supply market, the presence of suitable uh, products and services. So back to the technological background, when you see some kind of issues present, you should also uh, see that there is a, a supply uh, of this uh, equipment and skills are present. The development of market opportunities, limited trade project different uh, in a different development stages. So there should be an ability to segregate which project is several uh, different development stages, and there should be a possibility to trade with them. This is one of the minimal requirements, and there should be a basic business models in place. So uh, company maturity should be focusing on. Uh, gathering know-how. Next comes the transition from loan scheme to insurance, public insurance scheme. So this is a more, uh, more uh, advanced level of the market. This is, could be a case in Molasse Basin in Germany and uh, partially, uh, partially but not completely in, uh, in, the, in the Oberrhein Graben in, in Germany. But uh, to be honest, not all uh, criteria are reaching this uh, this level. So on this level, on the, on this level uh, of transition, uh, following things must be taken into consideration. The licensing pr uh, procedures must be further standardized. So in case of the st uh, stakeholder acceptance, uh, the main objective uh, remains the same. Improvement of geological data is uh, should be starting uh, to focus the model of developed uh, 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 geological mo model of the developed project, the heat flow, how the the subsurface uh, fluids are uh, changing. There should be a pre predictability of ESP lifetime, one of the most uh, important asset of the each geothermal project. There should be also an improvement uh, in the monitoring system. So now that you are on the further step of the geothermal market, you should be able to track and uh, take, uh, the present uh, project to see what is changing in them and what kind of uh, things must be made in order to prolong the effectiveness and effective lifetime of each project. And of course, one of the critical things uh, here is the access to underground data. So to give an example, in uh, Netherlands, this is uh, very well uh, the reality. The Germany, for Germany, it is uh, still a kind of an issue because the underground data is privatized and not shared, which is one of the predicaments for the further development of the market. The performance cost should uh, be uh, further uh, planned and actually predicted. So deviated. Of, so here also the OPEX costs could be quantifiable. So what, how much should be spent, for example, for the pumps, how much for the inhibitors and such. The, in case of the revenue, here comes one of the last changes, uh, which is standardization of uh, power purchase agreements and high predictability of the revenue. So when you start a project, you must know what kind of revenue and when uh, will be available for you. The market specializations uh, means that there will be a very uh, segregated uh, fields for each uh, given uh, aspect of the project. 
the subsurface, surface, and so on. Oh, sorry? Philip? Two minutes more? Yeah. Um, and have I jumped? Sorry. And in case of the improvement of market opportunities, there should be uh, regional based models in place. The development of specializations uh, must be the focus of the uh, of the markets. So this mainly is further uh, elaborated in the, one of the uh, next steps. And the last step uh, is one of the finalizing steps. This is a step that is actually happening in Dogger Basin in uh, France as well as in Netherlands. So at this stage, there is uh, a standardization of most of the aspects of, of the most of the criteria. So the regulatory environment uh, includes the adjustment of regulation for geothermal markets. So there should, should be some, some changes to the mining law, ensured legal security system, adjustment of the working hours. So this should be all known and standardized. The, Providing sufficient evidence to stakeholders, this remains the same. You should maintain the interest of all stakeholders in the field. Uh, the technological performance should already focus on the uh, 3D reservoir models. And uh, the cost at this level of the market maturity should be um, a little less than 10% from the plan. So the, the deviation of the cost should be at the minimum. After a power purchase agreement, there is not little uh, changes to the uh, actual improvement in, the, uh, in the, the revenue. There should be just uh, improvement in standards and such, but uh, there is little changes to this aspect. And the supplier market must be uh, stabilization of prices reduction of amount of innovation because uh, most of the innovations are already made since the digital market is still uh, a new field it is uh, it, there should be uh, some kind of a innovation made but at this level there will be not so sporadic innovations made saturation of the market so there's a, a possibility to invest in project por portfolio aside from single project so there should be a setup of the por portfolios and lastly uh, in case of the last level of the transition there should be an exchange of the uh, know-how between the companies possible this is actually what is happening right now in case of the uh, oil and gas industry so the market is so mature that the companies are interested in maintaining and uh, improving the market and stating some uh, level of the know-how for the public availability or exchanging it with one another. So with this, my presentation ends, but I would like to also indicate that in order to uh, support the projects, the risk mitigation is only one uh, aspect. There should be also such kind of ways as to give some grants for the development of district heating, and as well as the power purchase agreement should be also in place in order to create a security for the investors and all parties that are involved in the project. With this, I'm finalizing my presentation. In case you have any further questions, feel free to ask them in comments. Philip, I'm done. Thank you, Ferid. Uh, yes, really interesting presentation. Um, it was a lot of information given to you, so you be aware that that is also uh, reported in different uh, reports available online. I know it's my pleasure to ask uh, an expert on this topic, Alexander Richter, to give his feedback on the tools we presented. So what is your opinion? Thank you. Um, and actually, I, I don't have I don't have slides, so that's that's fine. Uh, first of all, actually, congratulations to the uh, GeoRISC team and and the work done. I mean, this is uh, I have to admit that kind of the detail and the level of detail that you've presented today is is, is remarkable. So, so thank you to Thomas Attila and uh, and Ferit for the for the really good presentations. Um, as naturally, we've talked a lot over the years. Uh, risk 
management and risk mitigation in geothermal is, is crucial. Uh, at the same time, we're also naturally facing the, the situation is that if we talk too much about risk in geothermal, we're getting less political support. So as much as we need the risk support, uh, we also face the challenges that we need to sell that there is risk, but geothermal also has to offer a lot. And that's why this is support and investment well spent. So these tools like the database and, and, and uh, the, the funds and, and all these work that has been done by the GeoRisk projects are really important tools in that aspect. But as I said, it is really important that we understand as an industry is that uh, there's one thing about talking about risk, but we also have to be careful not to talk too much about it uh, to really gain public support. And I think certain uh, recent uh, developments uh, in Europe kind of show that. Um, and so the public sphere and positioning geothermal is very crucial in that aspect. Uh, naturally, the risk management is we also have to understand really clearly where's the risk coming from and what aspects of that are manageable uh, in these discussions. And I think a lot of that, uh, these elements have been discussed as part of the presentation. Uh, the other uh, element as well is the notion of how do we, do we want to mitigate the risk or do we want to ensure the risk? Uh, and what are the te technology aspects of mitigating some of the, the risk in geothermal development? So, and I think that was the last word of the last presenter is really understanding this risk insurance or risk mitigation as one aspect in the overall development with all the other aspects uh, as well being tools in that regard as well. So a lot of the technical work that can be done beforehand can minimize the risk insurance that you need to take. Uh, from a financial perspective, I think the, the the notion here, and I think this is what we've experienced a lot in the in the in the development in geothermal, is that, that we have a lot of uh, investors talking about the need for a risk insurance, but when it comes down to it, nobody's really willing to pay for it. So that kind of puts me to the question of public versus private. I think that was also addressed very nicely in the in the structure, um, and, and this, this is also a philosophical uh, discussion, I guess, to have. Kind of, at one point, is the government required to support you? Geothermal. At one point, is the private market coming in? Uh, and I think, it's the, depending who you ask, the answer will always be different. Uh, the other thing is that we also have to understand on the financing perspective is that having more risk in projects also means that there is more return for the for the equity investor. So as much as the equity investor wants to kind of mitigate as much risk as possible, at the same time, it provides him higher returns on investments. So that that balance is, is really difficult, difficult to get. Uh, and there's another aspect here, and I think this is we've we've experienced this, and I, I think Matthias Tennis from Munich Re can talk a little bit about that, but the understanding of how risk insurance falls into the development. Uh, is it targeted to just repay any loss or is it to pay for saving a project and where that falls into place? And I think this is an important question to have. And I, and I particularly want to point to a recent news from Poland where uh, the a government scheme fund paid for drilling of a geothermal well but then also jumped in when the project was not successful to save the project by funding tools to save the project. Uh, and I think that balance, and it's it's likely part of your work, it's it's very important. Um, and But then again, I want to end and kind of maybe I'll leave some, some time if there's available, but to really understand is that there's a technology aspect as well that we have to understand and a certain aspects of risk that needs to be taken by the developer. You cannot really take off all the risk. Uh, and, and I think particularly for financial institutions, it has been particularly important is that there always needs to be some meat in the game by the developer. You cannot mitigate or ensure against all risks. That's not possible, should not be possible, uh, and should also not be the target of uh, a risk insurance scheme. Uh, and again, technology aspects are crucial. So really understanding technology development tools, uh, you know, being with, with heat needles or, 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 or nodes, et cetera, 
uh, seismic uh, studies, et cetera, et cetera, kind of really taking the technical aspects and understanding that developers can take those aspects to de-risk projects uh, are crucial. Uh, and I think with that, I just yield back to, to Philippe and, and the team and maybe if there are some questions and engage further. Thank you. Uh, thank you indeed. Uh, really crucial what you, what you say, Alex. And maybe what we have not yet reported because the first part is a bit of a theory and the second will be more on, on the practice. But indeed, this tool has been mainly successful for small developers and for the automatic thinking for municipalities where they cannot take nearly, nearly zero risk no, as being a, a municipality or a city. And indeed, we have to distinguish indeed who is using this tool and for which purpose. But uh, indeed, it was this part is, of the theory. And just like you just like you said, I mean, it's 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 really the difference. I mean, is this a private project or is this a project by a municipality? And really understanding kind of like how like the mitigation can be tailored towards that. At the same time, we also have to understand that for municipalities, funding is often easier to get due to the fact that they are secured by by an administration and, and and certain government aspects. So it's 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 always twofold. But yes, indeed, it really depends on who is the developer. Is this purely a financial uh, investment, a project, or is it a project with some wider social impact? Mm -hmm. But also, and the second point you highlight is crucial. We we had the idea in Joris we to focus on financial uh, mitigation tools. But you're right, we need also with innovation and new technologies to de-risk projects for resource assessment and access to the resource. But also um, a point which is uh, really highlighted in, in Europe today is that we need to have a better regulation for data sharing and reporting, that the data should be more available for, for other projects. But that it's some regulations are needed. But this is also part of, I guess, it's like I think that's something that uh, naturally in the licensing of, of projects or, or, or fields, that can be easily written into regulation that the data has to be made available and under what terms naturally it it depends but but that should be that should be possible and and I think this is why why your tools and the database that you created are very helpful for 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 communities or or, or regulators to understand certain aspects you know to prepare the industry for the future so this is fantastic work so congratulations mm -hmm. on that need to start um and to conclude this uh, discussion I know Thomas Attila or Ferit, do you want to add a point? No? Further inputs? No? So I thank you all. Thank you again, Alex, for really good input. And I keep uh, there. Um, you can also uh, contribute to, to the second uh, session and uh, to the roundtable discussion later, which is now coming. And I will give the floor to my colleague Thomas Garabetian for managing this session tool, which is not about the theory of uh, the risk price, but about the practice and with some presentation of successful risk mission schemes. Thomas, the floor is yours. We cannot, we cannot hear you. You should hear me. All right, so thank you, Philippe. Thank you, everybody. and. Uh, for, for being present and uh, following this webinar, and thank you to, to the panelists of the first panel who really gave you some gave us some uh, very good basis for for now this discussion on successful risk mitigation schemes. And we are going to look especially at international case studies. So in the Juris project, we have been obviously very focused on European schemes, but we have also been looking to uh, understand uh, various. Uh, scheme that are implemented globally uh, and what um, best practices can be applied and translated also beyond Europe uh, to really promote the, the success of the, the geothermal industry um, well all over the world. Uh, I'm first going to, to give the floor to Christian Boissavi from uh, the uh, French uh, Geothermal Association FPG uh, to present us the um, new French fund. So Christian. So I hope I we hope see your screen you and we hear you. It's okay. Yeah, everything is good. Okay. Okay. So we are going to talk about uh, about uh, what has been done in in France before and what we intend uh, to do to do now. So 
I will talk about the existing short and long-term risk system, and secondly, uh, of the new fund to be operational, I hope, in 2022. So what, what has been the key for success in Paris Basin has been uh, the risk mitigation system put in place by ADEME in uh, the 80s and revamped already uh, 12 years ago. So what is that? It's a financing system to cover the geological risk and we have the short-term risk. Uh, so the risk when drilling the, the first and the second well to, to operate a, a doublet. And the long-term risk is uh, in between the beginning of the, the operation and, and a, a long exploitation period, the risk you have uh, to see a decrease in the ratio product activity temperature of the geothermal resource. So as you can see on that picture, which is not so far from uh, what has been presented by Attila uh, for, for the Hungarian fund, because he told us that they, they were inspired by, by the French, uh, the French uh, SAF. So you see that more or less the same. You, you have some somebody over there, the SAF, uh, in, in in France, it's the Caisse des Dépôts et Consignations managing the fund. You have a technical committee giving a, a go or no go to the project. Uh, and uh, this technical committee is supported by, by the technical expertise of, of BRGM. So it's something very, very easy to achieve. So what is really the short term risk? So you see the curve, a very well known curve now. You have uh, the temperature here, the flow rate over there. And uh, uh, under uh, up to the green light, you are in the total success zone. So in, in that case, you don't need a, any support. If you're in a total failure zone, you, you need really to be reimbursed of one part of, of your investment. So what are the conditions at the moment to, to subscript uh, the, the, this insurance? So, we have seen already the acceptance of the project by a technical committee. Uh, not only looking at uh, technical and underground things, but also economical, financial, and juridical aspects. That's very important. Uh, second, the payment of three to five percent of the covered cost, depending on the of the zone. For example, for a typical dog at doublet in Ile de France, the insurance cost is around uh, 350 kilo euro and in that case uh, in Ile de France you reach a compensation of uh, 90 percent uh, because the uh, regional authority is giving an additional 25 percent to the 65 percent of the eligible cost which is not the case in the other part of, of the country so if we shift now to the long-term risk what has been covered so you see on the on the circle over there what is covered. So you see the, 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 the geothermal loop itself, including the two wells, the heat exchanger, etc. So something very simple. Um, how to get this, this uh, long-term risk uh, insurance, the acceptance of the rules, the payment of an annual fee of about uh, 15 kilo euro, and in case of uh, your productivity and temperature uh, of the geothermal resource is decreasing, you are going to be uh, to be reimbursed of a partial damage, of a total damage, if you cannot no more uh, exploit the geothermal doublets. So it's something very simple. What is interesting now is to see the, the result of the last fund, short and long term, are aggregated in uh, in this slide uh, for the period 2008 to 2020. So you see that the resources are at 24 million euro. Uh, if we are doing comparison with with uh, the Hungarian fund to be uh, to be now operated, you see that it's something not so far. Uh, Attila told us uh, of about six 16.7 million euro, so something like that. So you see that here uh, we are, uh, as as Ferry told us, uh, we are clearly in a public-private uh, system. You see the public participation by ADME is 47% and the private participation by developer uh, 53%. If we look at the expenses of the fund, 
you see that the reimbursement of failure is 53, the management and expertise 15, and the reserve after 12 years of operation 32%. So what are the benefits of this last fund? So you see the short-term benefit, we are talking about 80 geothermal waste covered, uh, talking about 33 doublet and triplet, and uh, 13 single wells. And during this period, we have 11 reimbursement, including seven failures, partial or total, and four related to extra costs. For example, to drill deeper than expected, to stimulate more the reservoir than expected, etc. And if you, if we go to long-term achievement, we are talking about 34 contracts signed for 400 years of coverage, and in that case, six failures already reimbursed for an average of 3% per year. So what, what is the idea now to, to move from this old fund to a new one? Um, so it's to attain the, the energy policy uh, numbers uh, called in, in France PPE uh, 2030, defined by the Ministry of Environment and elaborated in cooperation with the French Geothermal Association. So you see on that figure, if we if we look at uh, 200, uh, 2020, uh, you see that we are producing more or less 1.6 terawatt hour of, of geothermal energy for heat, heating and cooling. Huh? And uh, we have two assumptions. Uh, the PPE max uh, want uh, to, to go to 5.2 in 2030 and the PPE mean to 4 terawatt hour uh, at the same date. So you see that it's strong, a strong objective because we are talking about to multiply by 2.5 even in, in, the minimum, uh, in the minimum objective in 10 years. So it's very important and we have seen that uh, with a so small fund we have at the moment with only 8 million euro uh, in, uh, in cash it's not possible to propose uh, to, to, to make so many wells you see that the objective of the PPO mean is to have 90 successful wells per year. So we are talking about nine successful wells per year, which is an amazing number compared to the three or four um, before. And the philosophy, we change our philosophy, and now we are going to define different zone of risk in the country. So you see on the sweet color in zone one, uh, in that case, we are in well-known well -known zone and the risk is considered as very low. So for, for that, we are talking, for example, uh, of Ile-de-France and the Doguerre Reservoir. So in that case, the risk is very low. Uh, the percentage of failure of the first drilling uh, is only at 5%. So that's the first zone, the, the, the green zone, I would say. And afterward, we have zone two uh, with uh, uh, some knowledge, but uh, a little bit more risk. So we are talking in that case uh, about uh, other zones like Aquitaine, Eau de France, Occitanie. Uh, when there are uh, oil and gas drillings and, uh, and seismic, uh, and seismic uh, campaigns before, and you see that in that case, the first well has, has a percentage of potential percentage of failure of 25%. And in the last zone, which is the more risky in, in pink, so you see that here, uh, we are uh, in the other part of the French territory. Uh, we are uh, mainly outside of the, of the sedimentary basin. We have no oil and gas drillings. There are no reference well. And you see that in that case, uh, the percentage uh, of the first well to fail is 40%. And we change our philosophy I tried to move. Yes, and uh, we are going to, to go to a typical oil and gas analysis with the utilization of probabilistic plots depending on the level of risk in each zone. So you see again the three colors of the three zones and a typical uh, probability of success curve on, on the right part of the, of the screen. So that has been done, built by, by, by Capgemini uh, in a study financed by, by ADN.
I have difficulty to, okay. So what are the main, uh, the, the, what is the main framework of, of this new RMS? So we will maintain the same system with a short term and the long term uh, risk. Uh, you have seen that will we will be reimbursed the reimbursement now will be 90 percent but the on the entire territory even even the regional authority don't want to pay for that the state will go on um, the preliminary study uh, including seismic which is very important in not very well known are now included will be now included in the capex to be reimbursed in case of fear so we have seen already that we will have three zones uh, with different premium, which are adapted to the zones from 5% to the zone one to 10 in the zone two and 15 in the zone three. And we will maintain more or less as similar the long term, uh, just the fee will be a little bit upgraded and uh, go from 15 to 20 to 25 kilo euro per year. I would say that normally the management and the expertise will be will be amended, maybe, but will remain close to to the existing one. And normally, uh, the administration the administration of the risk mitigation system will remain uh, achieved by uh, the case de dépôt et consignation. So on the on the next slide, you see that uh, uh, Capgemini uh, has uh, treated uh, many many uh, different scenario and uh, uh, they calculate the investment of the of the state money for different scenario as you see on the on the picture we focus on two scenario which is a ppe mean one two and ppe mean one two three and uh, you see that uh, on the top you see that the initial uh, money put in the fund by the state will be something in between 140 and 193 million euro and at the end at the end of the fund if everything is running well the full financement of the state will remain 93 to 136 million euro so that that's the first approach and uh, if we go to see in details what there is in those scenarii, uh, you see that the number of campaign engaged in those two uh, green uh, scenario are in between 71 and 79 uh, campaigns. And the number of doublet uh, we are talking about is something in between 41 and 44. And normally with this uh, objective, we will fulfill uh, the objective of the PPE mean. Uh, what is the planning uh, to operate this uh, new fund? Uh, so uh, the study has been finished in April uh, 21. Uh, the different scenarios has been presented to both Ministry of Environment and Economic Affairs. Uh, okay, normally the people uh, have a positive uh, position regarding this fund, but the final decision is anticipated not before September of this year for more or less a 150 million euro uh, risk mitigation system. So due to the fact that there is anyway a strong state participation, the project has to be uh, approved by the DGCOM uh, uh, of the Europe of the of the Commission in Brussels. So with all this administrative constraint, I would say that normally the, the launch of this new fund is anticipated at the beginning of uh, 2023. So and if you have any question, I am not so far. Yep. Thank you, Christian, for, for your presentation. Uh, Maybe also will uh, before inviting uh, Ilker to to the floor. I will also invite all the, the attendees. If you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to 
uh, send them either via the chat or via the, the question function um, on the, the side of the, the little tool uh, of good webinar. Uh, now, Ilker, the, the floor is yours. You want to also share you your screen? Now? Yeah, we can see. Maybe if you are able. Yeah, this is perfect now. Okay. Uh... Hello everybody, uh, my name is Iker Kochak and I'm working as an engineer in development at Investment Bank of Turkey. Uh, we are the implementing uh, agency of the risk sharing mechanism, which is known as the Turkish Fund. Uh, so uh, in my presentation, I will start with some giving some uh, basic information about the Geotama uh, risk sharing mechanism in Turkey. Then it will be followed by uh, RSM progress updates for first and second round. Then it will be uh, finalized by uh, giving Lessons learned by uh, RSM first round, how RSM can be improved uh, in the second round, and how uh, will this uh, experience will be shared with the target companies of GeoRisk projects. So, uh, if you look for the geothermal support mechanism in Turkey, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it starts with the uh, critical milestone, which was the geothermal uh, law, which was introduced in 2007. Uh, so, in summary, there are uh, two main mechanisms to develop the national geothermal resources in Turkey. One of them is the uh, selling price, known as the fit mechanism, and the second one is our topic, which is the risk sharing mechanism, which is to mitigate and uh, mitigate the exploration and confirmation drilling states uh, for power plant and also heating projects. So, uh, how uh, all the things starts with RSM? Uh, the RSM agreement uh, was signed with uh, TKYB and World Bank on the end of 2016. The project actually has two components. RSM is not the only component. It has two components. The first component is RSM, uh, is to establish a risk sharing mechanism for resource validation to support the exploration and confirmation of drilling states. Second component is to set up a loan facility to resource development to provide financing to the resource development stage and to power plant and development phases. So uh, another important thing uh, I would like to mention in Turkey is that we had a feed inside mechanism, which is also used in some of European countries as well. Uh, the old uh, feed inside uh, law uh, coming to use in 2011 and uh, it ended uh, in the end of. Uh, uh, 2020. Uh, the uh, government extended the uh, deadline uh, to uh, end of uh, June 2021. So in the old tariff, we have a base fee and we have a local equipment bonus. In the in the old tariff, the base fee was around 10.5 US dollar cents per kilowatt hour of equipment to produce. We also have a bonus is, uh, for the uh, components you manufactured in Turkey. You get a bonus for five years. Uh, if you uh, add these two components, uh, you get a, a feeding tariff of about 13.2 US dollar per cent. In the new tariff, tariff which was introduced in the uh, uh, starting of this year, uh, the uh, power plants which come in operation starting from 1 July uh, 2021 will get uh, around 7.3 uh, 7 uh, US dollar cents per kilowatt hour of electricity generated. Uh, there is around a 45% uh, decrease uh, in the feeding tariff, but uh, even the, the tariffs uh, decrease dramatically. Uh, it is still assumed that uh, these numbers are competitive according to Turkish markets. So, if we look for the RSM flow diagram, uh, our money comes from World Bank Clean Technology Fund. Uh, the finance coming World Bank Clean Technology Fund is come to the implementing implementing agency, which is Development and Investment Bank of Turkey. Uh, RSM implementation unit, uh, which is formed under engineering department, uh, is uh, in the action with beneficiaries under the predefined pre pre beneficiary agreement. We also have a RSM consultant company, which gives us monitoring and supervising activities. This RSM consultant can also give reporting and monitoring activities between beneficiaries. So uh, this is how uh, RSM works in Turkey. If we go into details, uh, first I want to say that uh, we have started uh, the uh, first round of RSM in 2018, but uh, most uh, of the uh, achievements uh, completed in uh, 2019. Uh, so uh, now we are uh, co uh, continuing both first round and second round has also started, and we are continuing both both first and second round in RSM progress. There are some differences uh, between states. Uh, I will mention this in the end of the presentation. 
but uh, regarding uh, the, there is an important fact which is the coverage ratio coverage ratio uh, is a, a number which is uh, defined by uh, the uh, coverage ratio of the wells uh, according to the well project was uh, located uh, you get a coverage ratio this coverage ratio can be 60 percent or 40 percent it's fixed it can be either 60 or uh, 40 percent Regardless of the coverage ratio of three wells being 60 or 40, if fourth and fifth wells are drilled, RSM coverage ratio will be 40% for each. Again, I'd like to mention that uh, you, your pro a project can lie in a, a region that uh, your coverage can be 60%. But if you drill fourth and fifth wells, your RSM coverage ratio will be, will be 40% fixed. If the Thus, with the scope of RSM are successful, a 5% success fee that is calculated on acceptable well cost will be received. For the fourth and fifth wells under RSM, the success fee is calculated as 10% of the acceptable well cost. Uh, this is another thing uh, which uh, was changed in the second round. Uh, actually, uh, in the first introduction, the 5% success fee was introduced as 10%, and 10% success fee, which is uh, calculated for fourth and Fifth was was 25 percent in the original contract. The maximum payout. Sorry. The no. Sorry. Any, any questions? Oh, il y a eu 108 personnes. Ah, c'est une nouvelle présentation. Hein? Okay. Uh, the maximum payout from the RSM for a single project will be kept around 4 million US dollars. Carbon dioxide concentration in fluid of any well will result in emission levels more than the value of the year prior to the year when the drilling was completed. RSM program will be terminated if two wells of the program becomes unsuccessful. Here are the coverage ratios. Uh, if your project lies in Manisa, Leiden and Denizli and, uh, in some certain districts, such as Ahmetli, Salihli and Alashir, you get only 40% of share. If your project is outside this world, uh, the those that are marked with blue are at 40 percent so uh, the all other regions uh, get around 60 percent of share uh, what is the logic uh, under, under this idea is uh, we want to uh, concentrate on the deep zones we know that uh, there are lots of uh, geothermal potential in these zones but we would like to concentrate on the other zones. so if you, your project lies in these other zones you get 60 percent of your acceptable values so uh, here is the RSM implementation process. You get well test results from wells, which are the technical parameters such as enthalpy, temperature, flow rate, and uh, well head uh, power. Uh, if your well test results meet the success criteria, your uh, well is uh, named as successful well or abundant successful well. You have a carbon dioxide cap uh, after this step. For example, uh, if your uh, well had uh, power is below the, your success criteria then uh, your, your well is an unsuccessful well uh, you, you, have, you have an unsuccessful well you have to get your money back that's the main logic but uh, we also look for the carbon dioxide for example carbon dioxide is below the limit so you get your money for the first well and you can continue for the second well you didn't do the second well second well is again successful that agreement terminated and you get your RSM payout for the first and the second step. Another case, you are very not successful, uh, but you are above the carbon dioxide cap. So uh, let's say you have 600 gram uh, of carbon dioxide, and your bed is unsuccessful. Your bed is unsuccessful. Your uh, your agreement is terminated, but you cannot continue to the second bed. You get your money back for the first round but you cannot continue to the second one. What is the situation in the successful well? For example, your well is successful. Uh, you have to pay successful fee, but we again look, look for the carbon dioxide. If carbon, di carbon dioxide is above the limit, let's, let's say again, 600, agreement is terminated, we do not get the 5% success fee for the beneficiaries. Again, well is successful, but in this case, uh, it is below the limits. Uh, you go for the second well, you go for the third well, and if all wells are successful, and assuming that uh, your carbon dioxide is below the cap, uh, you be receive RSS success fee, which uh, is around 5% uh, for the first three well and 
third verb set for the fourth and the fifth verb. Uh, what have we done in the first two rounds? In the first rounds, uh, we totally get uh, 20, 21 projects. Uh, one of the project, only one of the projects was a heating project, and all other 20 projects was uh, power generation, I mean, electricity projects. All applications evaluated uh, to transcort, and seven projects were selected as potential beneficiaries of RSM first round. Four of them uh, was located in the 60% of coverage, and three of them are located in the 40% coverage. It's assumed that uh, there should be uh, 18 exploration beds covered in RSM first round, if all of them are built, and the uh, expected power plant capacity is around 100 megawatts. But as I first thought, maximum payout potential, I mean, if all wells fail and we pay all the money to beneficiaries, uh, it's expected to have a payout uh, potential of around uh, $15 million. Negotiation period of six projects were completed, and we have signed agreement uh, with three of them. <laughs> the activities are still ongoing for two projects in NIDA. Four of the projects uh, are in the court cases, which I will mention later. Sorry. Uh, the second round, we had a consultation uh, workshop in January 2021. We have completed exploration of interest stage and 18 exploration of interest have been received until March 2021. We held on to this training for shortlisted uh, applicants uh, in April 2021. Uh, we, uh, after uh, receiving AOVs, I mean 18 AOVs, we have received four, 14 full applications. Evaluation of full applications, I mean scoring and uh, evaluation of them are still going on. Two of the projects lie in fourth region and all remaining uh, 12 projects are six region. We can say that uh, there is a, a huge interest in uh, the undiscovered regions. It's a good idea. It's, it's the good thing actually for Turkish geothermal market. Uh, for, for the uh, 14 applications, uh, we have received uh, eight electricity I mean, power generation projects and uh, three district heating projects. We have a, a new area which is uh, integrated projects, and we have three projects for power and heat applications. So, what have we learned in the first round? Uh, defining the successful uh, criteria, criteria, which is here, when we, we named it was successful or not. Defining the success criteria is the most critical uh, point of risk sharing. During the first rounds of RSM, the project has delayed about one year. The risk experience in the first round were mainly related to the evaluation process and fulfillment of safeguard requirements. If you look for the evaluation progress, significant amount of time was spent on, on evaluating applications that did not fulfill requirements. It took several iterations to formulate the presentation of the evaluation results in the final evaluation period of RSM. RSM consultant. What about safeguard issues? None of the RSMs, unfortunately, uh, complete the fulfilled the safeguard requirements at the time of applications. The KYB and RSM consultant team spent most of their time to finalize and standardize the safeguard reports of the applicants. Among the seven uh, shortest benef beneficiaries, four of them lies in the minus type. Minus type is in the uh, 40% region. Uh, the progress is less than expected for these projects. These projects got environmental impact assessment, not record, or environmental impact assessment, positive decisions. Uh, but Manisa administrative court cancelled many of these environmental impact assessment decisions. Uh, due to these court decisions, uh, it's not possibly determined the timeline for implementation of these projects. So uh, the court case is still going on, so we are not sure how long will this stage will go and uh, if the beneficiaries can continue to drill uh, their work, uh, or they will cancel, they will have to <coughs> cancel their projects. Since the drilling activities could not have been started for this project, we could not make a, 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 a fully utilized budget. For two projects uh, in need, there is no uh, administrative or legal uh, program. So uh, drilling, uh, uh, drilling activities are ongoing for these projects. Based on the experiences in first round, RSM coverage ratio for the districts where huge resistance against geothermal projects can be lowered. I mean, uh, there is a huge uh, resistance in Mainsa region. Uh, projects, uh, especially geothermal projects, which are coming from geothermal region, are going uh, around 100% uh, to courts. So uh, courts can take uh, sometimes uh, some cancellation measures. 
So it should be uh, in mind that uh, maybe uh, re removing these uh, regions from RSM uh, content can be think about it. Uh, we also did a questionnaire uh, from uh, applicants for feedback. We included 22 questions for the beneficiaries. Six uh, feedbacks were received from applicants and evaluated. The concentration was on environment and safety conditions and well testing requirements, the well testing requirements on business plans. Uh, in the time of uh, questionnaire was done, vegan tariff was not introduced yet. So uh, applicants mainly concentrated on uh, di difficulties uh, on uh, and uncertainties on selling price uh, on electricity. Uh, this questionnaire was taken in 2020. So uh, we have made some uh, improvements. What was the what was improved in first and second round? Let's look at uh, this all together. Applicant. Uh, in the first round, there was no shortlisting during the uh, expression of interest stage. We developed a request for expression of interest stage in order to prepare a shortlist of interest developers for the second round. This gives us the uh, flexibility to avoid delays caused as a result of dealing with less qualified applications. We didn't hold a, hold a uh, consultation workshop on the first round, but in the second round, we had a, a one day consultation workshop. We obtained feedback from applicants in earlier stages on RSM, and we, we can, like the first uh, bullet, we can still avoid delays caused as a result of less qualified applications. Yeah. Ilka, uh, sorry, are you able to wrap up in uh, a couple minutes? Sure, sure. We are a little bit late. Thank you. I have three or four slides left. Uh, so uh, uh, in the first round, uh, we didn't cover. Uh, we only covered uh, related costs. In the second round, uh, we also covered surface exploration costs uh, and also airlifting and pump testing costs if they are needed during flow test. More coverage is expected to increase uh, by doing this. By uh, again uh, trying to uh, give attention to six percent regions. Uh, more coverage is expected to increase uh, for RS, also Gedis and Big Mandela's Grabans, which are in my son. Uh, as I said before, RSM success fee was 10% uh, for th first three months and 25% for fourth and fifth band. We decreased to 5% to first three months and for the first fifth band was 10%. By doing this, we uh, expect to increase interest in the program. Uh, there was no template uh, or standardized criteria uh, for the business plan. We developed a new uh, template for business plan. Uh, in the first round, uh, success criteria record pump testing for estimating well outputs. Uh, we get lots of objections uh, by uh, beneficiaries, uh, meaning uh, for uh, pump testing being uh, so uh, expensive and it's not cost effective. So uh, we uh, here uh, announced airlifting, which is cheaper but somehow less conclusive. The conditions of pump testing and airlifting require, requirement is uh, uh, defined for the uh, driven case. Uh, and the last one, uh, the carbon dioxide ca uh, cap uh, was 583 gram uh, in the first round. Uh, according to uh, new values coming from Minister of Environmental and National Resources, we decreased uh, this number to 540. So the carbon dioxide factor has been decreased uh, around 10% from first round to second round. So the last slide. How will RSM experience be shared with target countries of GRS project? Do you have a benchmark of current status of geothermal markets, regulations and geothermal risk mitigation schemes between the geothermal target countries and Turkey? Preparing the SWOT analysis of geothermal target countries' geothermal risk mitigation schemes to identify the main risk and how will their risk mitigation scheme be improved. Documentation and standardization of GRS target trunk countries' risk mitigation scheme are crucial for applicants to understand their methods and implementation process. As environmental and social issues and parameters are very important to avoid delay in geothermal exploration activities and affects the risk mitigation program, a brief study can also be conducted to elaborate the current environmental legislation of the target company. Thank you for listening.
Thank you, Ilka, for, for this very nice presentation. Uh, now I will call uh, Carlos Jorquera uh, from uh, Cinto Energy to present us the de-risking experience from, uh, from Chile. So, Carlos, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, maybe we need to make you a presenter. One second. Now you should be able to, to share your screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, not quite yet. Uh, it's loading. Yeah, now we can see. Now? Uh, we, okay. Yeah, it's perfect. Are you able to switch the screens because now we are seeing the presenter view and not the, the full screen slides? So now, let me now. I see. Yeah, now it's perfect. You can go ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the invitation. I want to talk about the risk mitigation schemes uh, in Chile. We had some experience here and I'm going to do a, a short introduction into that. But let me start uh, when we, when we, we, with explaining the context of Chile, since uh, when we speak about risks, uh, we need to also understand the context of the country. Chile is a totally different market to the European one. You are very used. And, and I also want to highlight that what is happening today in Chile, the way the market is structured, that is as very similar to Argentina, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. So most of the geothermal countries in South America have a similar market structure. And I think all of the topics I want to highlight here also apply to those countries. Uh, first of all, uh, what is particular in the Chilean context is that uh, according to the definition or the structure of the power market, there is not, not space for feeding tariff. This is, uh, I, I would say, the main topic uh, when advising risks, and I want to I wanna go to this deeper in the next slides, but the, the, the company or any developer is forced to, to, to get an agreement with a, an off-taker and sign a bilateral uh, PPA. That is the, I will say, the, the key issue here. And, and we, we have a deregulated market, and we have two types of, of markets where we can sell the energy, the spot market. We have an hourly spot market and contract markets. That's what I mentioned here, uh, we, uh, a direct relation with an, the off-taker. And we have also some uh, energy auctions process that are regulated. Um, and transmission and distribution are regulated uh, monopoles. And if you see to the right, there is a, a, a picture from Chile, from north to south, south, a very long country, 2,300 kilometers transmission system. And that's also make a lot of pressures due to congestions when transmitting renewables energies from the north to the south. Hey, in terms of, of the structure of the country, we have a national oil company that, uh, that is also a, a key player in the market. And since 2017, uh, this national company, oil company was established as a power generator. We have also uh, some renewable goals, 20% of the energy produced by 2025. I think by this year we are going to get there to this to this goal, uh, and the government is now working uh, to improve that that goal for 2030 by getting up to 30 or 50 percent. Uh, we are in a process of the commissioning of coal plants, uh, and the goal that was agreed uh, or announced in the last last month is that 100 percent of of all of these coal facilities are going to be offline by 2025. And in terms of country, we have a carbon neutrality goal by 2050. So this is driving the power sector also, also the energy sector in general and the power sector. Um, and, and yes, and this I would say this is the main the main 
concept around the country. In terms of PPA options, I mentioned very quickly bilateral negotiation with off takers, mainly, mainly the mining sector here in Chile is, is very intensive in power consumption. Where there you can sell, they, they normally get PPAs on sizes starting from 50 megawatts up to 300, 400 megawatts, depending on, on the installation. That sector is today uh, going into a, into a green copper production uh, as, as a goal. Uh, the, the, at least for, for geothermal, this is a, a, a segment market for, uh, of interest. Uh, energy auctions for the regulated sector. Uh, there is a process I will describe uh, later, but it's a, a regulated process run by the energy ministry. Um, the prices there, PPAs, are in a range of 40 US dollar per megawatt hour. So not very attractive for the development of, of a geothermal project. Spot market, and we have a type of of stabilized spot market for small renewable energy projects, less than nine megawatt installed capacity. Uh, about uh, the geothermal sector today in Chile, we have one power plant, Cerro Pavilion, uh, 48 megawatts online, 33 under construction. So by the end of this year, we're going to have 81 megawatts online. Uh, the company behind that project is Geothermica del Norte, that is a joint venture between Enel, Green Power, and the National Oil Company. Then we have Energy EDC. They are developing a 100 megawatt project, Transmart. Also, they are going with a strategy for starting with a small power plant uh, around nine megawatts, and then uh, growing up up to 100 megawatts. And the rest of the companies listed there, there is no much information on what they are doing at these days. Uh, we have a geothermal load, uh, a concessional system. We have an exploration and exploitation concession. And uh, what is also a, a key point to consider here in terms of risk, there is an indigenous consultation. Uh, when communities are located next to the project. We have some incentives for the sector, BIT exemptions, so 100%, uh, custom fee exemptions, also 100%. We can accelerate the depreciation of the investment in one year. Uh, there are some risk mitigation funds for Chile that I will, uh, I will explain in the next slide. To date, the potential that refers to a part of the country and also only to the to the uh, to the mountains or to the Andes is estimated in at least 300 500 megawatts. There is a theoretical potential estimated based on, on Vulcanos areas that talks on 16,000 megawatts. Um, but the, the key fact here is that the, the country potential needs to be updated. We have no idea on what is the potential inside cities for doing cogeneration. And so what we when we hear from potential potential uh, on Chile, the same for Argentina, Peru, Colombia, and Ecuador is based on unknown uh, high enthalpy resources located in the Andes. Uh, let me start now going to the experience in Chile by using risk mitigation schemes. Uh, I will start with, with one that uh, Munich Re, the insurance company from Germany, they came to Chile before 2014 and they were trying to, to when, we, when they were developing this insurance uh, for failure wells, they tried to implement that here. But in what I know, the size of the market was not that adequate for having a, a specific uh, insurance for, for Chile. Therefore, uh, it didn't succeed. Uh, and the first one we saw in the market was the MIRIC, geothermal risk mitigation mechanisms from the CTF that was operated by the, by the IDB in Chile in 2014. That was a fund that started with 50 uh, 
52 millions and uh, later on 20 additional 20 millions came into the fund so there was a 72 million fund and the idea at that time was to provide to each uh, project around 30 million uh, uh, in terms of, of credit and the reason behind that is that when we look into the particularities of a, a project in Chile, we need to understand that for de-risking the project, we need to drill at least three wells. That, that is the main setup for a project in Chile. And also that the cost for a drilling uh, is around 6 million per well, plus the, the, the move and the move of the rig and all services around that. So it is an expensive uh, work that needs to be done before getting up to uh, ready to build. Uh, under this project, Cerro Pabellón was developed. They got a, a grant, sorry, they got a, a, a credit uh, as a risk mitigation during the exploration phase uh, of almost 30 million. Uh, that's the number I, I, I know, but and there were other two projects that also qualified, but didn't use the fund. And the reason of that, that was because in Chile, uh, at the power sector, companies are used to use a, a, a project finance type, type structure of credits. And in this case, the MIRIC was based on a corporate uh, credit for the company. So, and, and where is the problem here? going back to the risk issue is that you can succeed with the exploration you can the risk the project and get to ready to build but very likely you will not have uh, the right ppa uh, for having a business case and and this is the main one of the main topics uh, we need to address on a future uh, risk mitigation scheme for chile is that you might you might be success successful on the technical side, but you will not be clear if you will have a, a, a business case in the future. So uh, as I mentioned, if you go into the energy auctions today, PPAs there are in the range of 40 US dollar per megawatt hour, and you will not uh, pay a project with that with that with such a PPA. Then we have uh, since 2016 the GDF uh, that is still uh, working here in, in for Latin America, uh, structured by the KFW Development Bank and uh, several donors. Uh, and this this fund has been used uh, a lot for exploration since it is a grant at exploration level and by being successfully uh, on, on exploration it's very easy to get uh, to the drilling uh, fund in terms of 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 uh, the amount a project gets here is totally different to the miric we are talking about or close to six million euros per project so we are we are we are a uh, we are having a, a, we are securing one well a failure risk. As I mentioned to you, the tender for the regulated sector, according to the government, is also a type of in local risk mitigation scheme. But uh, and, and there is there are specific conditions for geothermal project that don't have so the geothermal project the only requirement here is to have an environmental impact assessment in place and a proven resource that can be based on exploration data with or without uh, drilled wells. Uh, this is uh, if you if you if you get a PPA under this process, you will have it before before starting with the drilling campaign, and this is a good a good news. But as I mentioned to you. You are, your PPA is competing with solar technologies, wind technologies that are in a range of 40 or less US dollar per megawatt hour. And the, so in terms of reality, uh, is true according uh, in terms of structure, this 
this uh, option exists, but this material not not a real uh, business case for a geothermal project. And then uh, the fourth I mentioned here is geo risk to be implemented for the country, as you hear earlier from Philip. So Chile is listed as a priority country outside the, the European Union for geo risk, and we are also waiting to see what's going on under this this scheme. Thinking on the future, so the main topics that I need uh, a risk mitigation system uh, needs to address for Chile is the PPA risk. So you, we, we in the country, the specialists, they think uh, in terms of technical risk, uh, this is not that high, but the main risk is on the commercial side. So having the right PPA for a, for a project. And this means if you get a, a a risk mitigation scheme for doing the whole uh, appraisal or the whole uh, exploration drilling, you will be still facing a PPA risk. That is a difference to the to to, country, to countries that have a feeding tariff scheme. We have higher drilling costs, and and also for the risking a project since projects are are located in the Andes, uh, almost. 80 to 100 kilometers from the grid to the, from the national grid. Uh, here we are talking about uh, projects in sizes of 80 megawatts. So, um, for the risking a project from that size, there is a minimum required of at least three wells per project. That also needs to be account uh, when when structuring the fund. And uh, in terms of drilling success criteria, uh, at least for the for the Chilean environment, uh, since projects are far away from cities, this concept of, of having a dual uh, heat and power uh, well will not match in this type of projects because you will not have a chance for using the heat uh, uh, where, where the wells will be located, far away from the cities. So the drilling success criteria here uh, at least from what I know, four megawatts is, is a minimum a minimum expected power for, for a well to be considered as a, as a production well for, for this type of project. So this is my my presentation. Just want to wanted to highlight these these issues on the PPA, higher drilling costs and drilling and CIS criteria that needs to be specifically addressed for, for the Chilean context. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, so we are running a, a little bit late, then I will call uh, Alison uh, Thompson from uh, Kanjea to, to take the floor. So Alison, you. Yes, hello, I think I'm off of mute and oh good, you can see yeah, my- Yeah, you should be able to, we see your screen. Uh, maybe if you are able to, to put it uh, full screen, yes, maybe. Okay, thanks very yeah. much. Yeah, that's perfect now. Excellent, okay, good morning or afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to share my time with you and and uh, do my bit of being up in the middle of the night because I know all the Europeans and, and Asian countries have to do that when North America puts on presentations. So uh, I think we only have about 15 minutes left and it's been a, a long presentation already. So uh, I am a fast talker, but I, I'm also hoping that there's going to be some Q&A uh, in the chat box or uh, follow up by email. And so with that, I'll attempt to give an overview of, kind of where Canada is, uh, both finally and, and also where we're gonna be in the future. And um, one of the first things, uh, let's see what's wrong, I'm not able to advance. What am I doing wrong that I'm not able to advance my slide? Sorry folks. Maybe it's just a slow delay. Uh, Kenjia, the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association is uh, membership association and so I'll just give a shout out to those members right now and really I, I think the the big problem is that we're a big country and there are many types of, of geothermal plays and exploration techniques that will exist and so when we've had 
zero geothermal being produced, both heat or electricity, for the 100 years that the rest of you have been using geothermal. It's been incredibly difficult for uh, both the country and the governments to kind of figure out, you know, where, where do you start? And um, my next slide is about uh, a little bit of an overview of a map of kind of Western and Northern Canada, but um, you know, similarly, I could show the whole country and you're going to see that while we have hundreds of, of hot springs and I'll call that kind of the hot, wet or the fractured rock geothermal and um, most easily used for just heat. Uh, none of them really are being used for anything commercial beyond a, a handful of small hot spring operators and uh, not even using them for greenhouses or, or any other type of commercial heat. Then we have in kind of the middle of the country, the prairies, the, the hot sedimentary aquifers, which have been dominated by oil and gas use over the past hundred years. And while it's very tempting for the governments to want to help the oil and gas industry transition to green energy or to use the wealth of data, um, you know, th this is deeper geothermal. And uh, while everyone likes to say a lot of data exists, not necessarily at the depth that you need to get the temperatures for geothermal. And not all the plays are homogenous or they're quite heterogenic when uh, when you're dealing with permeability or porosity. And so it, it seems like a very straightforward thing to do, but, uh, but even for us with uh, literally almost a million wells drilled across Canada for oil and gas, uh, even for us, there, there's risk in these plays. And then you have the varying types of, of uh, enhanced geothermal systems, um, you know, shallower ones, deeper ones, you know, in incredibly uh, hard rock. Um, in other types, it's more sedimentary, but you're using advanced techniques. So um, part of our kind of stall right now in the country is there's just so much to tackle. And it becomes, you know, in our opinion, uh, really a, a question of, of prioritization. So going on to my next slide, I'm hoping that I, I'm able to paint for you something that's maybe, maybe not so obvious. We actually have two ends of the market spectrum. And um, advancing my slides to, to the next one, you have uh, where most people would love to play, which is within grants. And then you have also these oil and gas co-produced fluids projects that, uh, that are so well developed and currently operating a, as an oil or gas project that they are able to accept private risk insurance and uh, kind of everything in between. And, and so uh, because of the COVID situation, some repayable grants were given out as well. We haven't yet played in the convertible grant market in, in Canada, and uh, there is not a public or a public-private partnership schemes or, or insurance right now. And that's, that's really something that's, um, at least 10 years, the industry has been asking the government to kind of get behind. So for those companies who are unable to win a grant or the grants are uh, are filled up or not tailored to your type of project application, had there been a public insurance scheme, some of those projects could still go forward. And so we, we kind of have two extremes right now, the, the, the oil and gas co-produced fluids that don't need necessarily much more help and, and could accept private insurance, and then everyone else who's playing at that capacity building or at that grant stage. So we'll go to the next slide. Hopefully it's advancing okay. So but what we're finding is, is um, the word geothermal has always been a bit of a difficult word to use. And, and I, I related to when people use the word hydrocarbon. You know, in Canada, hydrocarbon could be natural gas. It could be sweet or sour natural gas. It could be oil sand. It could be tight oil, heavy oil. Uh, we do ourselves, I think, a disservice in the industry when we just say the word geothermal. Uh, most people in the public still think we're talking about geo exchange, which, which clearly we're not. But even the word geothermal, are you now speaking about electricity? Are you speaking about heat? Are you speaking about, again, that enhanced geothermal system or that hot spring that's already coming up at, uh, you know, essentially boiling or um, certainly at temperatures well above what you would need for a commercial heat project? And so, you know, our, our comments back to the government uh, or to the risk market is that uh, we can't just say, oh, geothermal can use private insurance. When, when a regulator or a government hears that, uh, they immediately kind of swing and, and think the, the market is much more mature than it is. And if one company or one project or one co-produced project can uh, work very well with private risk insurance, surely everybody else can as well. 
and uh, and that that's just not the case. I mean, especially when so much of our our projects are are greenfield or at that research stage or needing capacity building. Uh, so moving to the the next slide. Uh, Interesting as well, I, I talked briefly about it, that the oil and gas data itself offers a, a lot of benefits, but there, there is a catch here in Canada. Again, our oil and gas industry uh, is at least 100 years old. And so the way the, the laws are being set up for, for risk is that brownfield pollution risk is now something that uh, a geothermal developer is going to inherit. They, they didn't create the problem, but in, in our laws, you're going to end up with, with that risk as well. And so moving to the next slide, we, we just have uh, something that maybe other countries don't have. Maybe maybe America might have this as well, and they're pushed to, to have the oil and gas industry be more included as, as a, a transition to geothermal. Uh, we at Kinjia firmly believe that the polluter pays principle should be paramount. Uh, but what you have, at least in Alberta, and this may um, may go to the other oil and gas producing provinces and territories of, of the country, is that if you want to take on a well site or even well infrastructure or, or any type of infrastructure left behind by an oil and gas company, uh, you as a developer of geothermal need to assume all of that risk. And I know a lot of us are very passionate about geothermal. We're very enthusiastic. You know, we're also impatient. We want to get it done. And so our, our concern is that we're going to be uh, kind of accepting of, of risk that uh, that really is in many multiples of, of dollars uh, more costly as risk than even the the product of, of selling geothermal energy. So we'll, we'll move to our, our next slide, and and you'll see uh, some of what what Kangia believes that we we would like. A risk assessment done before land from oil and gas is transferred to geothermal and that all forward risk should accrue back to oil and gas and what the government is saying is, is that last bullet point oh well don't worry too much everyone in the country everyone in the province always has you know with a high price lawyer the ability to appeal to the environment protection and enhancement act which takes a, a look back at all the previous owners and there may be there may be a whole chain of them but are they now credit worthy? Are they bankrupt? Are, are they are they around even? Uh, it's while there's maybe like general pollution for for brownfield risk, the the immediate taking on uh, it's just it's just not playing well for for geothermal developers to kind of have a, a fresh start and uh, and really understand what their costs now and in the future may be because of risk. And so I'll pause there to say that um, if this isn't a type of risk, because it's not drilling risk, if this isn't a type of risk that the risk insurance market globally is thinking of, this is a product I believe that our country and the United States is going to need or, uh, or greatly appreciate as well. Okay, moving on to um, the next idea is that uh, something we, we've long considered at Kangia is that because we're so big and it, it's there's so much to do that we need to prioritize. And so prior, priority areas of research uh, for grants, they must follow commercial readiness. I mean, there, there certainly can be um, a portfolio of longer, uh, midterm and near term, but to, um, to have the academics and the geological surveys now focused um, on longer term versus getting on with the industry and allowing some market ready, commercial ready projects to uh, to begin is just slowing down the industry and slowing down the ability for the risk insurance industry to get involved as well. So moving to the, the next slide, uh, again, Kanji has been at this for a while, almost 10 years ago in the planning stages and we, we put the report out uh, we have looked at what, what technologies maybe would be needed in the oil and gas and, and geothermal technology transfer area to get some projects started. And uh, th this, this paper here, this document served uh, a nice place for a long time to kind of prioritize maybe where some government funding should go, where some consortium funding with academic institutions should go. And uh, it's probably time to refresh a document like this. But um, getting to some more controversial things on the next couple of slides before I wrap up uh, would be the grant opportunities. And, and almost everybody has spoken about electricity. And, and, uh, and Canada, Canada went that way as well in, in 2018. I mean, for a long time, we've had wind, we've had solar. Uh, geothermal 
well, before Kangia got involved, wasn't even classified as renewable energy, and you know, we had to you know, change that. But then we missed out on a whole bunch of grants that wind and solar had over the past 20, even in 30 years. And so finally we get our chance and uh, they didn't make a geothermal grant. They fit us in to uh, really second generation offshore wind, tidal, all these advanced renewables. And because the, the second generation of the wind and solar are so far ahead of us, uh, it was electricity focused. And so for geothermal to be to be fit in, uh, heat wasn't allowed. And so we've gone from kind of nothing in Canada to kind of going all the way, maybe past the moon, all the way to, to visiting Mars. Uh, it, it's really kind of pushed us very far and um, it's both been been good and bad. So absolutely, you know, like go Saskatchewan, go oil and gas patch technology transfer. It has created a wealth of technical advancements in the hot sedimentary aquifer and the oil and gas technique sector that can be now shared throughout the world. Uh, however, it's also pushed projects, uh, HSA in particular, larger and bigger than they were ever intended to be, uh, at least as a first project. And so now we're managing project risk and major projects. So what we're talking, uh, you know, a quarter of a billion dollars, half a billion dollars, literally a hundred times, at least 10 times larger than, than a, a much more simple project that could just, you know, get built, get online, uh, begin to educate the public, get some feedback, get some of those inventories that would be put into a risk insurance program. And, uh, and so there, there's some kind of further challenges. Things are taking longer. They're, they're five times larger than initially thought they needed to be. But again, because of the economy of scale is needed and uh, it has accelerated some policy, but in accelerating policy, uh, the government is trying to do maybe the quickest thing, not necessarily setting up the geothermal industry for the long term. And at least in Alberta, we have uh, new acts being written, and they're very favoring the incumbents, oil and gas and mining. So, for example, if somebody else already owns kind of maybe uh, the rights to a column of land, uh, and there may be heat down there that nobody is using, if the oil and gas or the mining company uh, holds that land, you can't make them do geothermal. Uh, they may find you a nuisance. They don't want you anywhere near you. Uh, we have no surface access rights the same way an oil and gas company would have a surface access right. So it, it's uh, acts are being written, but uh, it remains to be seen how much they're used. And again, coupled with that, perhaps inheriting some some pollution, brown risk, brownfield risk. Uh, it's it's the next couple of years will be really interesting for us. But um, but the last thing on on this uh, this slide here is because of that that government push to have electricity projects, it, it's really slowed just the heat market. And I think we all know who our competitors are for heat, you know, traditionally natural gas, uh, or maybe some other types of uh, district heating. But in, in even in the space of um, 2018 to now 2021, like a three to four year, uh, our, our competitors really aren't just natural gas anymore. Now we have things like hydrogen and renewable natural gas. And I hope maybe I'm gonna coin the phrase here as opposed to the internet of things, I wanna say the electrification of everything or the electrification of things. Uh, if you think about the inefficient it is to first create electricity from say coal or, or hydro, uh, send it a thousand kilometers on a wire and then drop it back down again into electric heat uh, versus just having where available geothermal or district heating. Uh, but that's that's who we're competing against now. The, the large crown utilities, the incumbents across the country uh, or even wind and solar, they know how to make electricity. So now they want to electrify everything. And that's not necessarily in the best interest of uh, the environment, uh, land use, certainly cost. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's become even more difficult to, to think about how geothermal can fit into to the market. We're, we're kind of losing some ground. Uh, but we're all up for the game and, and, and still very passionate about it. Uh, the next slide is um, a different type of of uh, barrier as well is that back to that prioritization is when you have academia or the geological surveys or the provincial geological societies who don't have project developers on their committees. So the oil and gas and the mining committees have, have developers on them, but the geothermal uh, committee doesn't have a developer on it. You have the incumbents like a BC Hydro or the provincial government who is telling everybody we don't want electricity and maybe until 2040. Well, then that sets the tone of their research. And so their research naturally will follow 
a 2040 uh, timeline where let's do something more uh, long term, regional, maybe it will work, maybe we can share learnings. And so we have a situation as well. Uh, we talked about Saskatchewan, Alberta. I'll speak specifically about BC now, where we're studying things which are large and interesting, uh, but at the cost of not studying things where we have off-grid or remote or rural or, or carbon and intensive polluted communities who are supportive, encouraging and welcoming of heat projects. And because there hasn't been either grants or that um, provincial government push for heat because of electri electrification of everything or their, their view of, of electricity not being needed for another 20 years, uh, what you have are some of the, again, that 100 times less or order of magnitude projects not going forward at an accelerated pace in lieu of, of kind of mega projects going forward. And, uh, and so this is going to make it difficult for the risk insurance market to be large, varied and robust because there's only uh, a handful of projects versus many. And, and there are many that, that are available. And I, I think I'm now very close to the end. I know we're running out of time. Um, if I can help get to the next slide. Uh, we do need risk insurance in Canada. That, that's what I want to end on, is that if, if you're thinking about offering a product here, uh, even though there's grants, grants don't cover the, the whole amount. And so I'm on my last slide now, if we could advance it. What we have though, is some people do really need that private risk insurance. They have a, a brownfield project that, uh, that has some pollution risk. Uh, others of us uh, developers are at the stage where we uh, don't need a grant and, and we'd be happy to, to have a convertible grant, for example, or a, a public insurance scheme or certainly a public-private partnership. So I think we're out of time now, so I will stop there and uh, welcome any questions in the chat box or, or after the fact. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Alison, for, for this very nice presentation. Uh, now, before we, we can have a, a very, very quick Q&A, I will call uh, on Matthias Tonis uh, from Minicray to, to give us his, uh, his feedback on the, um, on the presentation we have seen uh, so far. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> Thank, can, can you hear me? Hopefully. Yes, we can hear you fine okay. and see you as well. Okay, okay. So thank you very much for all the previous uh, presentation. Um, to give my feedback here, I think um, France and Turkey, they have um, proven impressively uh, so far how uh, such kind of uh, risk mitigation schemes uh, should be implemented and how they can work. And I think uh, they're, um, <clears throat> so they're, the track record in these countries shows uh, also the success of these kind of uh, schemes. Um, uh, with regard to uh, the last presentations in Chile and Canada, I think these are very good examples uh, which show, um, yeah, where are uh, hurdles in implementing these things? Uh, for example, with regard to political things or also uh, jurisdiction <clears throat> and things like this. So um, all in all, uh, how um, um, should a, a risk mitigation scheme look like? And uh, I've got just a few bullet, bullet points here. Uh, um, at least from uh, our perspective within Munich Re, because of course we have made some experience uh, with regard to de-risking geothermal projects uh, and sometimes uh, it was a very hard uh, experience to be honest. So how shall these risk mitigation schemes look like? They should be accessible uh, for projects, so uh, which means not too complicated. And uh, they should also address, I think, the right risks, not, not each and any risks. And, and from our perspective, the, the right risks there are typically the exploration risk and also uh, the political risk, of course, if you, when you implement um, 
uh, for example, a power plant, you would, as an investor, you want to be sure that you can uh, generate electricity, whatever, for the next 20 or 25 years or so. Um, <clears throat> then I think the uh, success or failure threshold should be very fine-tuned. So, and uh, with regard to what, what Alex Richter, um, Alexander Richter mentioned uh, as well was, so for example, is there a possibility for a partial loss or do you always have a kind of, just a kind of a black and white solution? So failure or success. Um, <clears throat> I think such schemes should leverage public money uh, uh, to the to, uh, uh, on a, on a large scale, so that you don't have a kind of a water can effect uh, uh, where uh, uh, projects just get money and uh, uh, and the money is uh, basically lost. Um, it should adapt special needs uh, to, uh, I think, uh, uh, to the respective regions and uh, the markets. And I think uh, especially these uh, very good examples from France and Tur Turkey, uh, they have shown this uh, uh, very good. Um, um, also, the I think the developers need skin in the game. Uh, I think Alex uh, Richter mentioned this as well. Uh, so um, there's no, there there should be no incentive to let's say socialize uh, the downside and privatize uh, uh, only the upside. Um, so a failure in in this regard, a failure needs to hurt. Uh, all stakeholders. Um, and also, which I want to mention is, I think such schemes should uh, be sustainable. And uh, the, the question is always, so you, in the very beginning, you can uh, plan uh, a lot and say, okay, every third uh, project will fail or, or every fourth project will fail. But the, the main question is what happens if all these failures are in the very beginning of such schemes? What happens then? So uh, will it raise any questions from politicians, for example? Uh, will it be the end of such funds and, 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 and uh, uh, things like this, questions like, like this, uh, they should be um, addressed? Um, it should not overcompensate any projects um, and uh, I think uh, uh, there should be a very close look uh, especially um, uh, at the uh, uh, yeah, thresholds of these insurances. So uh, to give you an example, if you uh, insure whatever 80 liters per second uh, of, of uh, flow rate and uh, the, the project is at, at whatever 78 uh, liters per second, is it a, re a real failure or can something be done to rescue these projects? Um, with regard to uh, uh, to come back uh, to the presentations, with regard to Chile and Canada, uh, I've visited both countries, and I think Carlos mentioned uh, this. I think that was in 2014 or 2013. And what I've uh, um, what I remember are also the very rough conditions uh, in Chile with high altitudes, strong winds, and and things like this. So I think. Uh, these are very special conditions there uh, uh, they uh, these people have to to deal with and uh, also very impressive was I think the presentation from Alison um, with regard to the size of the country and, and uh, uh, in, in recent times we have some experience especially in the oil and gas industry in North America and uh, I know uh, what uh, she was talking about uh, also with regard to liabilities, whatever uh, uh, liabilities to P and A wells and and things like this. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Matthias, uh, for this excellent summary of the of the discussion. Uh, I don't think I have much to, to add to that. Uh, we have just received a, a question uh, for Carlos. Uh, so if you if you're able to answer, the question is from Chris McCorm McCormick. Sorry, it's asking whether um, the um, you whether you can explain the uh, the transmission cost uh, part in bilateral PPA and um, whether there is a, a fixed pricing for it uh, or uh, whether the, the government is obligated to uh, to wield the power by law so i guess to to transport the the power so carlos are you do you have some um, some detail on this answer maybe i can put it in the chat as well if you if you want to be able to uh, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid that carlos has left already he, he excuse right. him Get to leave. Sorry for that. So we will be uh, we will be providing uh, an answer to to this question later. Uh, since we are quite late already, I think uh, unfortunately we won't have time for for much more of a Q and A. But thank you all for for your presentation. And I will now give the the floor to Philippe for the the concluding remarks. Yes, thank you all for having attending this webinar. I hope you enjoy these two parts. First, the presentation of the tools we have developed during these 32 months. As you have heard also from us, uh, the project is not yet concluded. We will conclude them in September. We will plan another dissemination activity in, in September. But in the meantime, if you have seen something in the tools we have developed that you want to comment or you want to, to provide your input for your country, feel free to contact us. We are really open to, to answer the challenge you, you will bring to us. So as I said, until end of September, we'll accept um, and we'll try to do our best to answer the challenges and the issues or other input you will provide to us. So thank you all. I thank uh, especially all the panelists. I think for an initial uh, session, it was quite interesting. We have tried in two thousand and to sum up all the work done, but as you know, this topic is quite complex. It's, it's not new, but it is, it's quite uh, complex. So thank you all for the participants. A special thanks to the two internals uh, with a feedback, Alex Richter and, and Matthias Tonis. Really appreciated that you are there today and you have provided a valuable input that also we will have to, to think about uh, um, in our project. So I thank also the partners of the project who have not been contributed today, but they are contributed to the production of the tools. And thank you all of you for having attended this webinar. We were more than 100. I don't look at exactly the numbers, but it was really well attended. Thank you all and uh, keep safe. I hope we will soon see you in a real physical event to further exchange after doing a networking drink. I wish you a good afternoon if you are in Europe and a good rest of the day if you are outside Europe. Hope to see you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Goodbye.